Good morning. Happy to see you here this morning. Um, if you can tell by the slideshow on the screen, we just finished up with Vacation Bible School. And that was an awesome week. Uh, one of my favorite things about Vacation Bible School was being able to pray with the kids and asking for their prayer requests because you never knew what they were going to say. It was a lot different than adults. Um, you know, you would get with equal conviction uh, requests for sick loved ones. And then my favorite was, could you pray that my mom's pickles turn out well? And I thought, you know, but that's how it should be, right? You know, God does care about your needs and he cares about your life. He cares about the big things and the small things. So as we do our prelude this morning, I hope you think of all those things that maybe you need to lay before God this morning. So let's pray and then we'll do our prelude. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this great week that we had at Vacation Bible School. Lord, I just pray that you would be with us this morning. Help us to praise you, to worship you, and to hear what your word has to say to us today. Lord, I ask all this in your name. Amen. If you would all please stand and join us in our opening song, Waymaker. We've sang this before earlier this year, and hopefully some of our Vacation Bible School kids will find this one familiar as well.
favor?
right, at this time, can we have all of the kids that went to VBS come on up? And I think you guys are going to do some songs for us. And DJ Cupcake as well. Well, good morning, everyone. I am DJ Cupcake, and I got to help Chef Steve with his food truck this week. I also got to hang out with all these awesome little chefs and listen to them sing all week long. They're going to sing a couple songs for you today that they learned this week during Vacation Bible School, and we hope that you enjoy. on the word of God.
Thank you for kids, <clears throat> for your songs and presentation this morning. Thank you for all those who are part of the Bible school this week, for those who prepared, for teachers, for helpers, for guides. Um, thank you for a wonderful week. This morning's scripture can be found in Genesis. We're in chapter 1. Verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then moving to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him... All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Please join us in our prayer song, More Precious Than Silver. Well, I'd like to take a minute and um, announce that after the service today, we're going to be having a, a luncheon here. So you're all welcome to join us. And in fact, they're going to start uh, cooking for that pretty soon. Uh, I think the Men's Fellowship is preparing some hot dogs and hamburgers. If you could, really quick, um, if you're planning on staying for that lunch, could you raise your hand just so that they know about how many to prepare for right away? Count all those, Fred, you got it. <laughs> all right. So this morning, um, I had a few excited teens this morning because they saw the title of the message. It's the, the dragon message. And um, now I know everyone's probably really excited to find out what that is. Um, so a while back in youth group, I mean, this was years ago, we did a, a, some lesson series on uh, dragons. And it was one of my favorite series that we ever did. And since then, you know, it was apparently some, a favorite of some of the others, too. Um, actually, I've kind of become somewhat known for this. Uh, I ran into some people a while back that we had done a big youth group event with. And they saw me, and they're like, hey, you're the youth pastor that likes to talk about dragons. And I was like, yeah, I guess. Um, I guess there's worse things to be known for. But uh, it makes it sound like I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons or something, um, which I don't. Or that I, you know, decorate my office with all kinds of dragons and things like that, which I also don't. Uh, but maybe I should after this. Um, but yeah, the, 
every, uh, about every year, you know, when we do Youth Sunday, I always ask the teens, hey, what do you want to do for Youth Sunday? What, like, what should we talk about? And without fail, there's always at least a couple, if not more, that say, we should talk about dragons for Youth Sunday. And the answer has always been no, because, you know, that series took, like, over a month to do, and I'm like, I got to cram that into a small, short sermon for Sunday morning, and there's no way I could do it justice. But Pastor Steve is out for two weeks, <laughs> which means that I have the rare opportunity to give two sermons in a row. So I'm going to take advantage of this, and today we are going to do the dragon message. So hopefully you're intrigued. Um, it's going to take us a bit to get there, but we will get there eventually. Uh, so that's your teaser. You know, that's to keep you awake for the rest of the message. Um, all right, so to introduce this message, um, we need to start all the way back at the beginning, uh, which Scott just read for us, Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created now, it's the first line in the Bible, and it has so much bearing on the rest of your worldview. In the beginning, God. Unfortunately, there are many Christians in the world who believe that, you know, Genesis doesn't really matter that much. Um, like, look, all you need is Jesus and the New Testament, and that'll get you by. Um, and I would really caution you from taking that stance, um, especially removing Jesus from creation. If we look at the New Testament in John 1, which also was just read, this is how John introduces his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he continues in verse 14 later, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word being spoken of. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was there in the beginning. All things were made by him, through him, and for him to bring glory to Jesus Christ. You cannot separate Jesus from creation. In the beginning, God created. Now, unfortunately, this is a phrase that is mocked much in the education system today. Uh, when I was in college, I took a modern science class that was supposed to be all about um, the most recent discoveries. I mean, a lot of times we would talk about stuff that was happening that week. It was like the most recent modern scientific discoveries. And most of the class ended up being about how, you know, scientists were struggling to understand the age of the universe and how it all got here and the origins. And one thing that they were certain of, though, was that it was definitely millions, if not billions, of years old. This is how the beginning of every science book starts, isn't it? In the beginning, millions of years ago. Billions of years ago. Not in the beginning, God. See, what the Christian says is that with God, all things are possible. That's Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. But the rest of the world has to look at the same things and say, with time, all things are possible. That's why the earth keeps getting older and older and older. Um, you know, the current agreed upon age of the earth is about four and a half billion years old. That's what they're saying now. Because they keep observing how complex and how amazing and how just insanely detailed the universe is, and they say, well, it, it couldn't have happened in a million years. It had to have been 50 million years. It could have been more and more time. See, with, with time, all things are possible. And if you don't believe that, well, you're just a dumb, gullible Christian. I remember one student was giving a presentation. Uh, a couple guys got up front of my class, and they were giving a presentation on, and it ended up being about um, vaccines. And mind you, this was way before COVID, so that wasn't part of the discussion. But the 
the stereotype that he was working with, and you know this isn't really true, but the, the stereotype that he had in his head was that all Christians were against vaccines. All Christians were anti-vaccine. And so he gave his presentation and talked about it. And then his conclusion was, was that when it comes to vaccines, people should be allowed to do what they want. And I was like, wow, we might actually agree on something there. But he said the conclusion was because we should allow Christians to not vaccinate their kids. We should allow Christians to not vaccinate themselves because that way natural selection will take place and all the Christians will die off. And that's pretty much the attitude of my class. That's how it went. You know, the professor didn't really disagree, didn't really say anything. That was it. So we live in a decidedly post-Christian era in the United States. I mean, if you look around, it's not very hard to see. Our country is thumbing its nose at God and any kind of Christian ideology. And the next, you know, the next phase of transition then, if we keep heading that way, is not post-Christian, it's anti-Christian. And some would say we're definitely already there in some parts of the country. But we're paying the consequences of a, of a society without God. You know, we took prayer out of the schools a long time ago, and since prayer was removed from the public school, in 1962, we've had a six-fold increase in violent crime, our divorce rate has tripled, uh, births to single mothers have increased five-fold, teenage suicide rates has tripled, and SAT scores have dropped 10%, which is even more impressive when you consider they're making the test easier and easier. Now you could say, well, there's no correlation there, right? You, you can't say that's the cause and effect, the correlation. Well, that depends on what your view of prayer is. How powerful is prayer? How powerful is God? Now I want you to think about these two worldviews. In the beginning, God, or in the beginning, billions of years ago, there was nothing. And that nothing exploded and made everything. And if that is true, that means a long time ago there was a single-celled organism. We don't know where it came from, but it was there. And that turned into a fish. And that fish turned into a frog, and that frog turned into a monkey, and that monkey turned into you. If that is true, then you have no more or less value than your dog or the trees outside. Because all that you are is a cosmic accident, just along with everything else. That is the logical conclusion. If that is true, you have no basis for morality. Why should I not steal? Well, it's wrong. Why? Because it hurts someone else. Why should I care? If we're all a massive cosmic accident, then we are here today and gone tomorrow, and I have no reason to do anything but seek out as much pleasure as humanly possible between now and the day that I die, because there's nothing else to live for. That is what happens when you carry out the, this belief to its conclusion. There is a great quote that I once heard, and I can't remember who said it or where exactly I heard it, but I want something like this. You cannot raise an entire generation of people telling them that they are evolved animals and then be surprised when they start acting like it's true. Why should I care about anyone or anything except my own pleasure and gain in this life? We're all just going to end up dead anyway, and none of it really matters. Years ago, um, in 2018, uh, Stephen Hawking the great scientist and philosopher uh, passed away. And I take no pleasure in that, but it was interesting to see people's reactions to his death. Everywhere on social media, people were posting all kinds of things that said, you know, rest in peace, uh, you know, all the great things that he did, rest in peace. And I thought that was really interesting, rest in peace. Everyone said that. Before he passed, though, this was one of his quotes. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. 
So according to him, after you die, there is nothing after death, just dark, just like you unplug the broken computer. And yet people from all religions, all worldviews, all walks of life still repeated the refrain, rest in peace. It's almost like Ecclesiastes 3.11 is true when it says God has put eternity in the hearts of man. Like you know, like you actually know deep down inside of you that there is something after we die. There is more after this life, and with any luck, we hope that it is restful and that it's peaceful. And so we say, rest in peace. This is the collision of two completely different worldviews. You know, God has been so forcibly removed from all education and all the schools, and yet we could talk about, you know, the crime rate and all these things that take place, pregnancies and, and the things that come out of that. I would say it again, you cannot raise an entire generation of people telling them that they're evolved monkeys and then be surprised when they act like it. But what can we say, you know, what, what can we do? Well, how can we combat this? Because, you know, all of the textbooks are against us. The PhDs, the doctors, the scientists, they're all against us Christians. They all believe that God is just a fairy tale and doesn't match the science. So this is what your kids are being raised on when you ship them off to school. So we often try to, um, in, in youth group, you know, we often try to encourage teens to ask questions. You know, anyone that's been through youth group knows that I love questions. Like, please ask questions. And, you know, sometimes I just force them to. I'll hand them a sheet of paper and be like, hey, write down a question. I know you have a question. Write it down, and we'll talk about it. And they always have really good questions, but one of the common ones that I see over and over and over again is, what about all the times where science contradicts the Bible? What do we do with that? So do we just, you know, throw our brains in the trash and throw logic and reasoning out the window and just say, well, I'll just close my eyes to it and, and try to maintain my biblical worldview? No, I'd like to prove otherwise. You know, an easy place to start with this is just that the science historically, is not always right. You know, how many times have we heard that the past couple of years? You've got to trust the science. Trust the science. Now, I'm not talking about COVID. That's not what we're talking about. But it, we've always heard, you know, you've got to trust the science. You know, in the 1930s and 1940s, doctors would encourage the public to take up smoking because it was considered good for pregnant mothers because it would calm their nerves during pregnancy. We look back at that and chuckle because how silly were they? Trust the science, I guess, though. I mean, they are doctors, after all. George Washington had a throat infection in his own home after he spent too much time out in the cold rain. The doctors did what they believed was the best science of the day, and they let blood out of his body. Because, you know, that was a good way to get your fever down. And so they did that, and it didn't help. So they called another doctor in, and they did the same thing. Let's, let's try it again. So they let more blood out. And at this point, you know, Martha started to get nervous and say, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And George said, no, no, these are doctors. They know what they're doing. And so a third doctor came and let out more blood. Nothing happened. And then a fourth doctor came along, and he let out even more blood. And shortly after, George Washington died probably a blood loss. You know, George Washington might be alive today if he hadn't lost all that blood. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that. <laughs> See, we're, well, we're smarter than that now. We know better. Are we? Are we smarter than that now? You don't think that 200 years from now, 100 years from now, we're not going to look back on today, or people, you know, we probably won't be there, but people won't look back on us today and think, I, I cannot believe that they believe that. I cannot believe that's what science told them. My point here is just this. Look, you cannot and you should not just blindly follow 
whatever the science or whatever the doctors say and the experts say, just because they are professionals does not mean that they are never wrong. Now, I do listen to doctors. I do listen to professionals, all right? I'm just saying you can't blindly follow that. This especially does not mean they don't have biases either. We all have biases. I have a bias, you have a bias. The experts all have biases. I believe that the Bible is the word of God and what it says is true. You could say, well, that's a bias. Now, I don't believe that blindly. I believe that you can test and prove the Bible. And I believe that you should test and prove the Bible. You know, that was one of our, you know, all the kids are gone, so I can't ask them, but that was one of our memory verses for VBS, wasn't it? You know, Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. It's like, taste and see. Try God out. Test him and see if he isn't good and if, see if he isn't true. I would argue that, you know, the atheist and those who seek to disprove the Bible have a moral bias to the conversation. You see, if God is real, the God of the Bible, if he's real, that means he made the universe. And if he made the universe, that means he owns it. And if he owns it, that means he gets to make all the rules. And some people really don't like God's rules. I'll give you an example of this kind of bias. Um, I remember reading one time in a, in a kind of a scientific article, and it was talking about um, when your hands get kind of pruney after you've been in water for too long. You know, when you spend a long day at the pool, you get out, your hands are all shriveled up. And it, it kind of studied, you know, that phenomena or whatever. And in the conclusion, this is what it said. There, the statement went something like this. This is an evolutionary trait that has developed over millions of years to help us grip things underwater. And I went, oh, really? There's absolutely nothing in that article that indicated anything about evolution. I could just as easily say God made us that way because God's really smart when it comes to things like that. I could say with equal certainty and equal conviction, but they have to keep promoting the lie that is that worldview. You know, Hitler has been attributed with this famous line, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it long enough, people will eventually come to believe it. Just keep repeating a lie over and over and over again, and people will eventually start to believe it. How many times in the education system do you hear millions of years ago, millions of years ago, with no basis at all, or just slap this on the end of any sentence at all, you know, this is the result of millions of years of evolution. We have opposable thumbs. This is the result of millions of years of evolution. Andrew's going bald. This is the result of millions of years of evolution. See, it works with any sentence. You just got to say it with conviction and say it confidently. Just slap it on there. See, I believe that in the beginning, God created Adam, and he formed him out of the dust of the earth, according to Genesis 2. And then God gave his greatest gift to Adam and all the men throughout history. He put Adam to sleep, and he formed Eve from one of his ribs. Do you want to know something absolutely wild? Is that the lower rib of a man is the only bone in the body that will regenerate itself. Actually, bone grafts are often taken from the lower rib because they know it'll grow back there. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, God knew what he was doing. It's almost like science caught up with the Bible when it comes to bone health and bone regeneration. I believe that the Bible is accurate when it records the history of mankind since the creation of Adam and Eve. You can add up the years of everyone's life their genealogy all the way from Adam down to Noah, and then from Noah down to Jesus 2,000 years ago. Add up all those years, and it's a whole lot less than four and a half billion years. Now, at this point, you know, we've been going for a while. You might be wondering, Andrew, what does this have to do with dragons? And that's a good question. Um, so let's say this. 
because let's say the Earth is around 6,000-ish years old, give or take, that, that presents some serious problems and questions that need to be answered. And as Christians, I believe that we should never be afraid of questions. We should never be afraid of science. After all, Jesus is not just the way, but also the truth and the life. Don't be afraid of what the questions are, what the questions will bring, because if we answer them honestly, we'll see God in them. You know what the definition of science is? And you won't find this in the textbook. But the definition of science is just this, observing what God has made. That's all it is. You shouldn't be afraid of that. So I propose that we observe in truth what science tells us. So what is the truth? The truth is that the evolutionary theory hinges on a lot of things, and we could spend hours and hours talking about all of them. I would love to, but there are a few vital ones that we can look at. Um, one of them, one of the big ones, is that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And there's that phrase again, millions of years ago. If you Google, when did dinosaurs live, you will get somewhere between 225 and 65 million years ago, that's when dinosaurs lived. If you Google then when people first appeared on Earth, you'll get about, well, it says human-like creatures started appearing on Earth about six million years ago. So for this to work, dinosaurs and people never lived together at the same time, ever. I mean, they're millions of years apart. But what if that isn't true? What if that's not true? Now, this is where things hopefully get interesting, and you will either think I'm crazy or you will be very intrigued. The word dinosaur was not invented until 1841. So, what did they call them before that? I mean, they knew about them. I mean, they were digging up fossils in the 1600s. What did they call dinosaurs before 1841? You can, find, uh, you can find drawings all over the place, all over the world, it, places in caves that depict dinosaurs and humans living together. Uh, there are the Ica burial stones, which are really interesting. There's thousands of them. And they were from about 400 to 700 AD. And there are thousands of stones depicting humans and dinosaurs living together at the same time. And also, I have a question for you. If no human's ever seen a live dinosaur, how do they know what they look like in 600 AD? I mean, that's pretty good drawing. It's pretty accurate, but how did they know what they looked like? I believe it's because they actually saw them. People and dinosaurs did live together at the same time, but they didn't call them dinosaurs because that word wasn't invented yet. What they did call them was dragons. Now stay with me, <laughs> because I know when I say dragon, everyone's like, okay, Harry Potter, video games, fantasy world, doesn't exist. It was interesting, I was reading a biography of Alfred the Great, uh, which was an old Anglo-Saxon king, and um, in England, before it was called England, it was a long time ago, amazing story, great uh, Christian character in history, but there was one part of the book that says in it, it talks about there being a dragon in the land. And there's a footnote there, and it points you to the bottom of the page, and it says, well, it says there was a dragon, but we know that they don't exist, so it must not have happened. But we believe the rest of the biography, just not that sentence. What if, <laughs> what if they were just dinosaurs? Well, what if we took off our 21st century glasses and removed from our minds the millions of years ago lie that's been pounded into our heads for years? What if we looked at it that way? There are all kinds of stories about dragons that appear right alongside historical data that we accept as true. But as soon as we hear the word dragon, we write it off because that must be fantasy. 
the Chinese calendar um, is made up of 12 animals. 11 real ones and one fictional one, apparently. You know, we've got the year of the cat, the dog, you know, the pig and all that, but then the dragon. So why use, why use one fictional animal and use 11 real ones? Well, probably because I think they actually saw one and they were real to them. You know, Marco Polo lived in China for a while around 1271 AD and reported that the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parade. Wow, that's interesting. It must be a fantasy. In 1611, there was a post in China also from the emperor posting the position of royal dragon feeder alongside a bunch of other normal job positions. Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Probably to feed the royal dragon. But I don't think they were dragons the way that we envision them today, because they didn't have the word for dinosaur then. Just remember, that word was not around, and they had to describe what they were seeing somehow. Now, if we go back to my bias, which was that I believe in the Bible, I believe the word of God, and that the word of God is true. Eventually, all science and all knowledge will have to catch up with the Bible in this life or the next. So what does the Bible say on this subject? Well, if we take a look at Job chapter 40, it's a really interesting passage. And in this passage, it talks about this beast. Now, right, and this is right in the middle of, you know, Job's finally cracked under the pressure. He cries out to God, explain yourself. And God sits him down and says, hey, where were you when I made all this? Where were you when I made the earth? Where were you when I stretched out the heavens? And in the middle of all that, he goes on describing his creation. He says, behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar the sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. God is describing to Job a mighty creature that Job has apparently already seen. Verse 19 says that he is the first of the works of God, and that word can be translated as chief. He's the first, he's the greatest of the works of God. The biggest dinosaur ever found was aptly named the Supersaurus, and it is 138 feet long, weighing in at about 40 tons. And here's a picture of him for scale. That's a big, that's a big animal. Now let's review what God says in the book of Job. It eats grass. Well, all of those kinds of dinosaurs were grass eaters. It gets its, or it's got a big belly. You know, that checks out in verse 16. Its strength is in its belly. Its tail was like the cedar in verse 17. That's a big tail, like a cedar tree. You know, he wasn't talking about an elephant. He wasn't talking about a rhino. That tail is like a cedar. He is the chief of the works of God, and Job saw him with his own eyes. A dinosaur probably less than a few thousand years ago, he saw him. Now, according to the Bible and according to, you know, the science and the history and all these things, the earth is not millions or billions of years old. It is actually quite frustrating to give a message like this because of just the sheer amount of data that I could pull from to talk about this. I mean, we could talk for hours and hours and hours, but... You know, we've got lunch waiting for us, and hopefully I can hit the high points. We could talk about how, you know, we found soft dinosaur tissue, and how scientists now have to figure out how did dinosaur tissue stay, stay soft for 70 million years? Well, it probably didn't. That would never occur to them, though, because they have that bias. How can virtually every nation on earth have history and drawings of dragons and dinosaurs as if they had really seen them? You know, supposed cavemen, how did they know what they looked like accurately? 
How can you go to natives in the jungles of Congo and show them a picture of a dinosaur and they say, yep, we've seen those, those are terrifying, on the edge of a huge jungle? How come there have been 20 foot long alligators found? Um, you know what a 20 foot long alligator is? That's a dinosaur. If you run across a 20 foot long alligator and you look at it, I'm thinking that's a dinosaur. Or a dragon if you've lived over 200 years ago. You know what dinosaur means? It just means terrible lizard. That's what the word dinosaur means. If I ran across an alligator that big, I would think that was a terrible lizard. Because just as the Bible said, in the beginning, God created. Because with God, all things are possible. He does not need billions of years. And because God made everything, here's the conclusion. He made you as well. You are not a cosmic accident. As the psalm says, you were knit together in your mother's womb. You were carefully crafted by God in his image. You bear the image of God. That means that you and all human life are immensely valuable. Immensely valuable. And the same Jesus that was there in the beginning making all things for him and through him is the same Jesus that loves you and died for you on a cross. That is the conclusion of in the beginning, God created. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Lord, I thank you for your word and for your truth. Lord, I thank you that we can trust your word and trust that when you say you made, that we can believe that you made. Lord, we thank you for the implications of that, that if you made us, that means how, how valuable are we to you, that you made us, that you love us, that we bear your image, and that you died for us. Lord, I pray that as we go today, we would live like that, live like we are created people, not just accidents, but that you made us and that you love us. Lord, please be with us today and bless our time of fellowship this afternoon. Lord, I just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Make me a servant. You can be seated. All right. <clears throat> One thing I always tell the teens when they go home from a lesson like that is, don't just tell your parents with zero context that Andrew believes in dragons. There's a lot more context to that. All right. Well, let me pray for us just before we go. Dear Lord, I pray that you would bless us today. I pray that you would bless our fellowship today and this afternoon. Lord, I pray that um, today you would just work in us, work the belief in us that we are made in your image and that we can lean on you, we can depend on you, and we can look to you for all things. Lord, I just pray that you would bless us as we go today. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have an announcement real quick, a couple announcements. Bible school went very well. Um, we had between 31 and 42 kids every, every day, and we had about 89 to 90 uh, total attendance here. And we collected $989.27 for Heifer International. So food truck party was great. We have a lot of pictures out there. Please take the pictures. 
that, of you, that you see of kids that you had. And we also have some groceries out there. Those are the things, the snacks and food left over from Vacation Bible School. Please take what you want because we need all of that gone. So there's plenty of things there for you to look at on your way out. There's also kids. There's also some crafts that you didn't pick up by your last day. They're out there on the table going out to the fellowship hall. So lots of things for you to look at as on your way out for our lunch. So thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Again, just to, to remind you all, there is a potluck lunch right after the service. That's in, uh, kind of in honor of uh, Bible school this week. Uh, whether you've brought anything prepared or not, please feel free to stay late. We've always got enough uh, for anyone to stay with. Um, also, I just mentioned that uh, coming uh, the week ahead, there is a trust meet, trustee meeting on Thursday night at 7. Um, and then one week from today, right after the worship service, we'll have a uh, district conference volunteer meeting. Those who have stepped forward and said, you're willing to help. Uh, that district conference is on the 11th and the 12th. But again, next Sunday, the 6th, We'll meet for a brief time right after the service. Um, if you have volunteered, you'll find in your mailboxes a schedule of the uh, weekend's activities. And if you have not volunteered and would like to, at the back of the sanctuary, there's a, a basket and an information sheet. You can uh, still sign up for that. That would be most appreciated. Was there any other church announcements that didn't make it either to the screens or the bulletin didn't get mentioned? Pat, Pat Ames. Keep in our prayers, Leonard Lovejoy. Are there any other prayer requests? Pat. Barb, Barb Wooding. Anyone else? Let us close then in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ability to come to you and to, to share our our ups and our downs, our joys, our concerns. Lord, we've heard just now a number of things that weigh heavily on us. We'd ask that you would be with each of these needs. We think of Leonard Lovejoy, of Ben Steiner, Michaela Welch, Nancy Keener. Lord, we also think of Dave and Marilyn Badger, we think of Dick and Helen Wessner, many others who we have kept close in our hearts and thoughts, and we ask that you would comfort them, be with them, those that are around them that give them care. Lord, we ask now that you would dismiss us, help us to have an enjoyable afternoon and a good week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.